Photosynthesis. So we're looking at the equation, the general equation for photosynthesis, carbon dioxide plus water, and you put in light energy, and you get sugar and oxygen out of that. So I keep saying you, it's actually a plant or any type of producer. So carbon dioxide is CO2, which means it's a carbon bonded to two oxygens, and then water, which is two hydrogens and an oxygen, and you make sugar, the plants make sugar out of that. And so these are very low energy molecules. You can breathe the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the air and drink as much water, that's an O, drink as much water as you like, you're not going to gain any energy that way. Um, but plants take the energy from sunlight and somehow make this high energy molecule. This is glucose or um, a type of sugar. And so you can um, gain weight from eating lots and lots of this. So plants take these low energy molecules and make a high energy molecule along with a byproduct. Byproduct in this case is oxygen. A byproduct is anything that's not the product that the organism is needing to make. It's just the the extra kind of a waste product. So here it is in picture form. Here's sunlight and it says here in the leaves chlorophyll which is a pigment traps light to make energy um, or light energy to make food and you get water, the water comes in from the roots. So if you have a plant that looks like this, and there are its roots, the water goes in through the roots and the carbon dioxide goes in through the leaves, through the little holes called stomata. And then the plant makes oxygen as a waste product and it makes sugar. The sugar will be used um, maybe right then, or it can be converted into starch, which is going to be stored uh, maybe in the roots, like a potato, for example, if this is a potato plant, then big potatoes will grow underground here, and that's where the starch would be stored for the winter. So we're going to spend today looking, or we're going to spend this video looking at the whole process. And so first we need to go backwards a little bit and look at energy molecules in general. So this is um, a structure for ATP which is um, something that transfers energy very well. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It's got a sugar group here and a nitrogenous base here, and it's got these three phosphate groups. And we've talked about this before. If you break this bond and reform some other bonds, you can release a lot of energy. And so ATP is a really, really good transfer molecule, but you can't store it for long periods of time. ATP is not good at energy storage. First of all, it doesn't store very much, and it's also very unstable. You really don't hang out like this very much. Um, the bonds will be broken, and you'll make um, ADP from that. So glucose, which is this, is a really, really good energy storage molecule, at least short term. If you want to store it longer, you would put a bunch of these monomers together to make starch if you're a plant. One molecule of glucose, this, stores 90 times more chemical energy than one molecule of ATP. So this thing is really, really good at energy storage compared to ATP. And again, this is actually not really that long-term storage. If you wanted long-term storage, you'd make a bunch of these put together to make a polysaccharide, and eventually you would convert it over to a fat if you're going to store it for much, much longer, if you're at least if you're an animal. So ATP is made in photosynthesis, but most of it is converted into glucose. We're going to spend our time um, talking about how light energy is used to make ATP, and then how ATP is used to put a bunch of carbon dioxides together to make glucose. First, we need to talk about pig plant pigments a little bit. This is chlorophyll A, and you don't need to memorize anything about this structure, but know that it's a pigment, and um, any kind of pigment can absorb light. Chlorophyll is the main light absorbing pigment in autotrophs, photoautotrophs like plants. There's chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, chlorophyll A being the um, more important one for now. Light. Light is, um, if you talk about white light, white light is actually made out of all the colors of the rainbow as you see here. And you can think of it about wa as waves or you can think of it in terms of particles. If you're thinking of it in terms of particles, you have to think of photons. A photon is defined as a particle of light. So we're used to thinking of light as these waves that come from the sun or from your light bulb or whatever. And they are, and this is how they behave. But light also behaves as a photon, as a little particle, because it takes just a certain amount of light to raise an electron up in energy level, for example. So that's why we have to define stuff like photons. So light is made of various wavelengths, and this is just a little bit of background on light before we go on. We perceive different wavelengths as different colors. And those are the colors. Whoops. And so here's the thing with light. If you have 
a glass of water and let's say that's a really bad glass of water anyway there's the water in here and so if you put a straw in that and let's say it's one of those bendy straws and it comes down like this you'll notice sometimes that when it goes into the water that it seems to move over a little bit and get thicker and then you take the straw out and you'll see the straw, straw is still very straight but the water makes it look like it's actually a bent straw and that's because every time light goes through a different medium it can bend and so it just bends all in the same direction more or less here so we just see this bent straw if you have a prism like this and you have white light entering the short wavelengths like this whoops sorry the long wavelengths are the red ones short wavelengths are here uh, purple and the blue those different wavelengths are going to change direction differently so one will bend a little bit more and the other one will bend not so much so you end up getting these colors of the rainbow like you have here so we perceive different wavelengths as different colors because we have receptors in our eyes that allow us to do that and so if this is the absorption curve um, and here's the wavelength of light here again you have those short wavelengths a little bit longer 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 so a wavelength is from the beginning up down and up again that's one wavelength and you can see this wavelength is much shorter anyway light the light, visible light that we can see comes in these different wavelengths and chlorophyll is able to absorb this stuff the violet and the blue doesn't absorb the green very well and not the yellow very well and then it absorbs the orange and the red pretty well too so different pigments absorb different wavelengths of light and chlorophyll absorbs blue violet that's this stuff and red best but chlorophyll absorbs uh, sorry chlor chlorophyll reflects the green stuff so when i'm looking at these um, plants the white light shines on it everything gets absorbed except the green gets bounced off and when i'm looking at that this is my eyeball when i'm looking at that it's only the green wavelength that actually goes into my eyeball that i can perceive so that's why plants look green this is an atom, and you might remember the nucleus and the first energy level that fits two electrons and the second energy level that fits eight and so on. So a photon is a light, uh, photons of light excite electrons in the plant's pigment. So they can raise, so this photon might be able to raise an electron up to this energy level, and that might be able to raise the electron up two energy levels, and a more energetic one might be able to raise it up even three energy levels. So excited electrons carry the absorbed energy, and that's really, really important because what plants are doing is changing sunlight energy into chemical energy. And so this atom is a, a chemical, right? So if a photon of light can excite an electron, you've just transferred energy from light energy to chemical energy. And that's what photosynthesis is all about. It's about light, it's about energy conversions. And in this case, you're converting um, light energy into chemical energy. You might remember from middle school other energy transformations, like when you plug in a mixer into the wall, you're changing electrical energy into mechanical energy. You might have talked about potential energy. Right now, we're going to be talking about light energy being converted into chemical energy. Excited electrons move to higher energy levels. These things are called energy levels, or you might have heard them um, referred to as shells, energy shells, around the nucleus. So this thing's an atom. Here's the nucleus. These are the shells that the various electrons fit in, or the energy levels. Each energy level has more energy. Structure of a chloroplast. So you should know generally what a chloroplast looks like. It's got two membranes, an outer membrane and an inner membrane. Those are really well named, huh? Here's the outer membrane, here's the inner membrane, hooray. Um, and you might remember the evolution of a mitochondrion. And we talked about that when there was a eukaryotic cell that took in, let's draw it this way, a prokaryotic cell like this until eventually you got this, this uh, little bacterium in here with a membrane around it and that would be an outer membrane and an inner membrane which is what you've got here so chloroplasts also have their own dna like mitochondria and we think they evolved from um from prokaryotes so we'll just look at the structure quickly here this stack of sacs here is called a granum each 
membrane is called a thylakoid, so each compartment here is a thylakoid, and a stack of these thylakoids is called a granum. And then the goop in here is called the stroma, so that's just like cytoplasm for a chloroplast. So we'll get that down. This is a double-membraned organelle, which is evidence that it evolved from a prokaryote, along with it having its own DNA and ribosomes. Granum is a stack of connected sacs called thylakoids. So the thylakoid is the part that's important here because the chlorophyll is stuck in these thylakoid membranes, and we're going to talk a lot about them. Stroma is the goop or the gel-like material around these sacs. And we're going to stop with this.